Hi, and welcome to the Lemonade Car Show on Rogers TV. I'm your host, Lorraine Summerfeld. Tonight, it's all about the Canadian International Auto Show, and as always, we'll be answering all of your car-related questions. The Lemonade Car Show is brought to you by OMVIC, Ontario's vehicle sales regulator, and we're produced by the APA, the Automobile Protection Association. The APA is a consumer association. It's membership-based and nonprofit, so we benefit you, the consumer. You can reach us at apa.ca or by phone at 416-204-1444. Joining me today is Ron Corbett. He's a writer with the APA, and Chris Muir. He's an instructor at Centennial College. We'll be taking your calls this evening at 800-968-7836. Welcome to the show, guys. Hello. Thank you. It's been a busy week. Ron, you're with me at the auto show, making me smart, which is, I'm always <laughs> grateful for that. It is a good show this year. Oh, yeah, it was totally awesome. A lot going on. Um, it's nice to see the industry pepping along for as long Do as it doing holds. Doing well, yes, and indeed. Cheap gas will, I'm sure, keep that going. And with you running around all over the place, you're happy for gas yeah. prices. Yeah. <laughs> Look, before we get going on stuff, do you think gas prices, uh, we all turn into idiots and start buying bigger and bigger vehicles when gas stays down and even though we know it can't last forever we're doing it but the numbers are extraordinary in the crossover and SUV numbers and we see the introductions are even higher yeah it's it's um I guess a lot of it may be driven by uh, the U.S. market, where gas is a lot cheaper. It's 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 generally cheaper, so uh, people generally buy a bigger car, and we just get a lot of cars just because uh, we're in the market next door. But uh, certainly, you see a lot of you know big big heavyweight cruisers on the streets, and I guess if someone is sitting on the sidelines saying, "Oh, gee, uh, you know, uh, if it's if it's a buck a liter or 87 cents versus a buck 50, well, I, I can justify buying this car now. Oh, what? We're so like dumb, I think sometimes. Like we know it can't last forever. Remember all the Hummers that were sitting on the lots, uh -huh. you know, eight years ago, but car manufacturers are just jumping in line going okay you want them we're gonna deliver them it, and it, it, it's a bit of a weird thing too because um, in the states they have the capper, uh, corporate average fuel economy regulations which are are becoming quite stringent it's going to become quite quite brutal quite hard to to meet the regulations so all these vehicles each vehicle like this that's uh, that's uses a lot of fuel is is hurting them as far as their uh, their cafe numbers and jaguar held out as long as they could but one of the ones we saw that we actually interviewed was their entry into the crossover market so let's take a look at what jaguar is introducing now Director of Design for Jaguar. Jaguar has finally come into the crossover market. Yeah. First question, what took you guys so long? Do you know what? When I started the job 15 years ago, they were asking me, should we do an SUV? And I said, no. They asked me 10 years ago, I still said no. They asked me five years ago, I still said no. So I didn't think it was fault? right. So partly my fault. <laughs> Everybody else felt the same. And then we asked the customers around the world, and they finally said, yeah, get on with it, will you? So it's just, and there's other things to be done as well. We had to revamp the rest of the range and bring out other new cars. So, yeah, we're kind of a bit late there, but when we get there, we come in with a bang. I was going to say, you've kept Jaguar styling intact. Thank you, yes, I think so. Was that a big, was that a big stressor or juggle to try and maintain? Yeah, it was, it was, it was a challenge, you know, because I'd never done a car like this before. All my cars are low and sleek and long, and this is all about height. And so we really had to work hard to make sure the lines in there worked like a sports car. And if you look at it, it's got some really nice felt lines, a little bit of the F-type around the back end. So, yeah, it's, uh, I think it's worked. Have, have you worked the aluminum architecture into this vehicle like you have yeah. the rest of the line? Yeah, this car is all aluminum, or aluminium, that's what we call it. <laughs> um, structure, it makes it very light. But also, even more important, it makes it very agile. It's a great car to drive. It's like a sports car to drive because it's not got a huge mass around it. You're talking about a two-liter diesel at some point coming in. Does the Volkswagen problem have, do you anticipate that having any impact on sales for a diesel? Not that we noticed, no. I've, we found that in Europe where diesels are prevalent, it hasn't really affected our sales at all. And uh, of course we do genuine diesels which work very well in terms of CO2 and NOx and everything else. So we're very confident that diesel is fine, but so far we've seen no rebound in that for us, no. 
In this segment, especially up in the luxury levels, the cars are doing really, really well. As you mentioned, you're a little bit late to the game. It is a beautiful vehicle. Do you have the capacity to keep up with anticipated sales? Like, are you? Well, every time I talk to the sales guys, the uh, the volume seems to be going up every day. So uh, I hope so. But you know, one thing we will not skimp on is quality. So we'll make the number of cars we can make within the quality we want to make them in. But I think we'll keep up. The, There'll be big demand, though. This looks like a car that's going to be a big seller for you, especially in North America, where these are the kind of cars that people are still wanting. Yeah. And actually, after the success of the F-Type, which yeah. just rejuvenated that yeah. into the brand, I think this is going to be a terrific car for the Jaguar. Yeah, do you know something that's quite ironic? It's probably going to be the biggest selling Jaguar ever. Okay, you just heard it here on tape. Ian Callum, who's head designer with Jaguar, is the biggest seller. Thanks, Sam. That's probably true. <laughs> Thank you. Probably not kidding when you look at what the Cayenne did for Porsche. It's yeah, their runaway bestseller. I, I, absolutely, I think it's going to be a real money maker for them, and certainly uh, it's really, really, really good looking. And I'm surprised they stayed out of the market as long as they did. I, I wonder if they thought what Chris has been nodding his head mm -hmm. for is that people would tip back to, you know, the smaller vehicles. That's for that F-Type, like the car. Oh, that's uh, a beautiful car. It's very yeah. nice. I, I remember seeing that a couple of years ago at the auto show, and I mean, it's beautiful. It's out of my budget, unfortunately, but yeah. the F-Type is, is gorgeous. Yeah, and I borrow it whenever I can. That's yeah. it. <laughs> <laughs> and then go look for a tunnel, so it, it sounds You can hear really the noise, yes, yeah. yes. Oh, so you, you just bought a Fiesta. Yep. Because you absolutely. needed a car that was easier on Decent gas. Decent on than fuel, than yeah. And the big ones are really good on fuel economy, which is stunning, even the big pickup trucks and stuff. but. Honestly, for scooting around, I'm happy when I see a Fiesta in the driveway because I know it, it's going to be so easy. I just really think we're heading for a brick wall. I know sales are great, but what, it, it can't keep well, going. Well, it's, it's been about seven years now of, of steadily increasing sales and in Canada. Last yeah. year it was like 1.7 million, or it was a huge number for Canada, and the States was 17 million. So you, know, you get to a point where everyone has a new car and, and they just stop. Thank Look you. what happened eight years ago, though. I mean, with the fuel prices, <sighs> all it takes is uh, a one governing body deciding that they no longer want to sell cheap fuel at, uh, you know, $24 a barrel or $19 a barrel, whatever they're selling it for these days, and the price skyrockets overnight. And next thing you know, there's a fleet of Suburbans just sitting somewhere yeah. that they can't move off the lot. I think what's been difficult, too, is the industry has been trying to push us into hybrids and, like, other powers because mm -hmm. they have to and the consumers are resisting like crazy and gas prices keep keep it on our side like we, we've we've said it before i mean nobody wants to be a guinea pig and, and this this for a lot of these technologies even if they are proven the consumer uh, portion of the program hasn't been proven and there's all these fears that you know a battery pack that's worth four or five thousand dollars is going to go after five or ten years where we're still going to be running our petrol engines right the battery prices are coming down mm -hmm. to be fair yeah they're coming down in line and what vancouver cabs are getting like five hundred thousand k mm -hmm. on a well, Prius I, before I, they have yeah to i think the toyota certainly have been lasting for for a yeah. decade with not much problem yeah. uh the big thing about hybrids when they first came in is that they were pretty substantial provincial subsidies yeah. like uh, rebates and stuff but those were withdrawn for several years ago and since then sales have really ontario really just, tanked ontario just reintroduced um some rebates i was reading last week yeah and and yeah. they all they altered things for uh the the figures for yeah. plugins and for pure electrics but also um they sort of re Rejig the um, uh, rejig the uh, the price threshold at which yeah. they'll offer a, uh, offer a good rebate because you know if you're spending a hundred thousand on a on a Tesla, well, you know you really don't need government assistance. Well, I mean that's and you're already you're deciding that's the car you want. Yeah. I know David Booth, friend of the show and my colleague, yeah. did a column last week on where the break even point. How expensive does fuel have to be before we'll start buying electrics mm -hmm. and hybrids? And basically, there is no number and you buy them because that's the vehicle you yeah, want to buy for absolutely. reasons outside of saving money because yeah. it's not going to come down it, to saving it, money. There's no, no sound economic uh, reasoning. The incentive isn't financial. It's yeah. because you want to be driving Green that kind of vehicle. Whatever. So I think we have to wrap our heads around that, which is going to take some time as well because, frankly, as George Eni is always saying, we vote with our buck no matter what we say when it comes down yeah. to car prices. It's mm -hmm. always about 
dollars. I mean, you look at uh, you look at people who buy cars uh, and get passionate about cars and everything else, and there's, there's this whole um, visceral kind of range of emotions that goes through, and we're not seeing that that favoritism towards electrics yet. I mean, there's small pockets, but. Um, enthusiasts they want to hear the roar of v8 or the, the spool of a turbocharger something right. like that while they're driving they want that real kind of experience so, and it's slower less so powerful than the electric we're not there yet we're not there yet <laughs> <laughs> the lemonade car show brought to you by onvic ontario's motor vehicle sales regulator returns after this short break when we come back we'll be taking your calls 800-968-7836